Hey everyone, I want to show you guys a quick promo video that we have made. Uh, actually, people from KYM has made this for all of us because on March 20th, we're going to be having a one-day retreat. It's on J uh, March 20th. It's a Saturday. It's going to be from 1 o'clock to 5 o'clock. Please make sure you're there. We prepared goods, goodies. We prepared prizes. We prepared games. We prepared some other stuff for you. You know, it's really unfortunate that, you know, each year as we have a winter retreat and summer retreat with the whole pandemic that's going on, we couldn't have it the past two times. But, you know, your teachers and I, we got together, we we kind of like brainstormed a little bit, and this is the best thing that we can prepare for you guys. So here, take a look at this and also save the date, save the time, March 20th, 1 o'clock to 5 o'clock. I lay my life, I lay my life down at your feet, you're the only one I need, I turn to you and you are always there, In troubled times it's you I see, I put you first, that's all I need, I humble all I am, all to you. One way, Jesus, you're the only one that I could live for. One way, Jesus, you're the only one that I could live for. You are always there. You are always, always there. Every hour and everywhere. Your grace abounds so deeply within me. You will never ever change Yesterday, today the same Forever till forever meets no end Come on! One way Jesus, you're the only one that I could live for One way Jesus, you're the only one that I could live for One way Jesus, you're the only one that I could live for. One way, Jesus, you're the only one that I could live for. You are the way, the truth, and the life. We live by faith and not by sight for you. We're living all for you. You are the way, the truth, and the life. We live by faith and not by sight for you. We're living all for you. Come on, you are the way. You are the way, the truth, and the life. We live by faith and not by sight for you. We're living all for you. One more time, you are the way. And you are the way, the truth, and the life. We live by faith and not by sight for you. We're living all for you. One way, Jesus, you're the only one that I could live for. One way, Jesus, you're the only one that I could live for. One way. Jesus, you're the only one that I could live for. One way, Jesus, you're the only one that I could live for. And 
you stood before creation eternity in your hand you spoke the earth into motion my soul now to stand You stood before my failure And carry the cross for my shame My sin weighed upon your shoulders My soul now to stand So what can I say? And what can I do? But offer this heart, oh God Completely to you So I walk upon salvation Your spirit alive in me My life to declare your promise My soul now to stand Come on, so what can I say? So what can I say? And what can I do? But offer this heart, oh God Completely to you So what can I say? So what can I say? And what can I do? But offer this heart, oh God Completely I'll stand so I'll stand with arms high and heart abandoned in awe of the one who gave it all yes I'll stand my soul Lord to you surrendered all I am is yours one more time, so I'll stand. Yes, I'll stand with arms high and heart abandoned in awe of the one who gave it all. Yes, I'll stand, my soul, Lord, to you surrendered all I am is yours. Lord, all I am is yours. So what can I say? And what can I do? But offer this heart, oh God, completely to you.
Hey, GPM. Hey, GPM, I know for a really, really long time, GPM didn't really have a pastor. Uh, we've been looking one for a very, very long time. And you know what? Pastor Shin, our education director, Pastor Hom, myself, our whole staff have been, really been praying and carefully searching for a pastor for GPM. And we think we finally found a person. Um, and he's going to come out and give a sermon today. Uh, he's recorded something and it'll come right now. But I do want to let you know something. Um, try to understand. He right now, because he's moving from one location to another, um, the video quality isn't the best and it's not the greatest, but he's tried his best. So please listen to the word. I, I, I listened to his message. I heard his background. He looks like a spot on person. So without further ado, I want to introduce to you guys the next GPM pastor. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Pastor Ju Kim and I'm really excited to share that I'll be coming on board the GPM family as the next high school pastor. Um, I'm originally a SoCal native, uh, lived there when I was much younger and then moved up to NorCal where I spent most of my life from elementary to all the way through college. And then I moved back down to SoCal to attend Biola University for my seminary training. I've been involved with various student ministries over the last 10 years and it's really my passion to see younger generation and young people like yourselves grow as worshipers before the Lord. I hope that we too, during our time together, can grow as worshipers living for the glory of Jesus Christ, in particular, growing in our Christ-grounded identity, uh, transforming into Christ-like character, and living out our Christ-glorifying calling that each and every one of us have been given. I'm currently living in a city called Raleigh, which uh, most of you guys probably have never heard of, but it's in a, a state called North Carolina on the other side of the coast, and uh, I will be moving back to the sunny side uh, in the coming months, and I hope that when the time comes that you and I will have a chance to meet, um, and preferably sooner than later meet in person, and that we'll be able to get to know one another and really grow this ministry and also grow as a family of God together. So thank you for inviting me and for welcoming me, and I look forward to the chance to continue to do this ministry with you all soon. Um, and in light of that, I'm also going to take this time to share today's word. Um, <clears throat> today's word comes from the book of Luke chapter 13, verses 22 through 30. I'll read for us. Um, uh, yeah, I'll read for us the word of God. He went on his way through towns and villages, teaching and journeying toward Jerusalem. And someone said to him, Lord, will those who are saved be few? And he said to them, strive to enter through the narrow door. For many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. When once the master of the house has risen and shut the door, and you begin to stand outside and to knock at the door, saying, Lord, open to us, and then he will answer to you. I do not know where you come from. Then you will begin to say, we ate and drank in your presence, and you taught in our streets. But he will say, I tell you, I do not know where you come from. Depart from me, all you workers of evil. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourselves cast out. And people will come from east and west and from north and south and recline at table in the kingdom of God. And behold, some are last who will be first, and some are first who will be last. Let me pray for us uh, shortly, and then we'll get started with the word. Father, we thank you for this time that we can gather um, and worship together and listen to your word. We know that, God, um, you know, all of this is being done online, virtually, but regardless of where we are at, I pray that, God, you would gather our hearts, uh, look towards you, and God, that uh, we worship you together at this time. We know that, God, you transcend space and time. And so would you be present in each and every one of our hearts and, and wherever we are. Um, help us to focus our hearts on you at this time. Speak to us, God, and help us, God, to grow our relationship with you more through the truth that you have for us. We thank you, God, and I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, one of the most foundational truths of the gospel is that we are welcomed into a relationship with the living God, right? The Bible describes this relationship in many ways, but uh, two prominent formats is that between a father and a child and also a husband and his bride, right? And the idea is clear when you look at it from those two standpoints, right? It's a family relationship. It is a relationship of the utmost intimacy of the closest um, knit that you can have, right? It is, it is, and it's not only just intimate, it's not just close, but it is a permanent relationship, right? It is like 
blood, right? And they say blood is thicker than water. And that's the kind of relationship that God invites each and every one of us into. Imagine if, <clears throat> right? So if we take that illustr illustration a little bit further, imagine if two people got married and then after the wedding, they were like, we did it. Yes, you know, go us. Um, we, we've done it, you know, we've accomplished marriage. And then they were like, all right, uh, see you around sometime. Hopefully, you know, you're doing well the next time I see you. And then, and then they went their separate ways. You would think if you were a spectator and you watched that happen, you would think that's quite odd, right? Because marriage is far more than just the wedding, right? Marriage begins in earnest when? It's actually begins, it begins in earnest or after the wedding, right? Wedding is just a ceremony, right? But marriage begins when they when the two people, right, earnestly begin living together and doing life together. They are sharing, you know, their lives with another and building their lives together, right? Tackling issues together, accompanying one another in this life journey, right? Or also imagine if a couple had a baby, right? And as the baby is born, you know, they're at the hospital, the mom and dad, you know, they go through the ordeal and they're like, all right, you know, go us, we did it. You know, we, we did the whole child childbirth thing. And, and then they're like, yes, you know, we, we, we're so proud of ourselves. And then, and then they just left the baby at the hospital, right? They're like, oh, we did it. You know, we brought a living being into the world. And then they just left the, left the baby at the hospital. You would be like, that's like completely odd, right? That'd be so unthinkable because raising a baby and bringing a baby into the earth and having a child is not just, you know, the, just the childbirth process, but it's actually what the growing up together, right? Investing your life into the child, into the baby, helping the child grow into a full human being, right? The emotional bond that you get to form through doing life together, right? And so actually the same can be said about the gospel, right? The gospel is not just about heaven. It's not just about, you know, avoiding hell. It's not just about being saved as in you're confessing Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior. And you're like, yes, you know, I, I'm, I, I now, you know, I know that if I die, I go to heaven. If you just think that that's it, there's nothing more beyond that, then you're like the couple that just got married at the wedding. And then they're like, all right, that's it. I'm done. Or you're, you're like a, a couple who had a baby and then they left the baby and they're like, that's it. Right. That, that is just the beginning. That's just the beginning in the same analogy, right? That should be viewed as very odd, but the gospel, the fullness of the gospel is ultimately truly about growing. It's about the relationship that follows. It's about the bond that follows. It's about the intimacy that follows in a relationship with God. It's about doing life with God together and growing in closeness in this permanent bond that we've been given in such a way that a couple does in marriage and a father does with a child, a newborn child, right? Hopefully you can see that analogy. All right, so in this passage, Jesus is preaching on his ministry while going through towns and villages when one day, um, some Jewish people come up to him and ask him, Lord, will those who are saved be few? And the Jews here are really asking this question, which is the wrong question. They're asking um, because they're concerned with the matter of salvation. They're saying, will every Jew be saved, right? There were um, various viewpoints uh, on salvation during that time among the Jewish community. Some people thought that all of Jewish people, the entire community, you know, every Jew will be saved. Some people thought that it's only a few, right, who've done, you know, uh, some who live a life that is in an acceptable manner and, and so forth. So it's not everybody. And so they're asking, who's going to be saved? Is it just a few? You know, is it is it everybody? But but the thing is, they're actually asking and they're focusing on the wrong thing. And so Jesus is going to redirect the question with an honest response. He says to them, strive to enter through the narrow door, right? And you're like, what? Jesus, right? We asked the question, how many of us is going to be safe, right? That's more like a, a yes, a lot, or no, not a lot, right? It's just like, it's like an answer that, that is numerically oriented. And you're telling us, enter through the narrow door, right? What are you saying, right? Jesus, what are you saying? This is what he's saying. What is the narrow door? Right? The narrow door is Jesus himself. Right? Jesus says in John, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. I'm the door, Jesus says about himself. So the narrow door here actually represents Jesus. Right? So enter through the narrow door. He's talking about himself. 
Um, and when he says enter through a narrow door, he's talking about the relationship that, he, that, that uh, we are to have with Jesus. It's a narrow relationship. In other words, it's an exclusive relationship, right? It's a narrow relationship because it's exclusive. How do you know when two people are in an exclusive relationship? When they've committed uh, to seeing only each other, right? Um, I was watching some video blogs on YouTube uh, of married couples who were talking on the topics of the pros and cons of marriage, right? Just came up and you know, I thought it was interesting, so I clicked on it. And, uh, and when it came to the cons, uh, the answer was almost unanimous. The answer, the first answer that came up was you lose freedom, which means you don't get to live life however you want anymore, right? When you're a bachelor, you can do whatever you want. You, know, you can watch TV as late as you want. You can stay out as late as you want. You can eat whenever you want. You can sleep however long you want. You can spend your weekends at however you want. You can spend money on whatever you want. You can buy whatever you want, right? There, you have this thing called freedom. There's no one restricting you, right? No one telling you anything. And you get to live life however you want. But inside a marriage union, right? Inside a marriage union, that is no longer possible. That is no longer possible because there are invisible boundaries, okay? You can't spend money however you want. Try doing that when you're married, right? Uh, you will get into some fights, okay? You, you just buy stuff and you just bring it home. Yeah, you're gonna end up in a fight, right? You can't just sleep over at your friends whenever you want, right? Just try not coming home. Imagine if your dad just didn't come home without telling your mom, there's gonna be a fight, right? Uh, if you just live life however you did before you got married as a single person, you are going to end up getting into a lot of fights, right? Why? Because marriage is exclusive. Marriage is narrow, which means that there are boundaries which means that there are rules and there are restrictions, okay? There's a, there's a voluntary surrender of freedom. You're giving up your freedom. Why? Why would anyone give up their freedom? Why? Because they are trying to pursue a deeper relationship, right? So every deep relationship, as the deeper it goes, the more intimate a relationship is, there is actually more of a voluntary surrender of freedom. There has to be because you're putting boundaries that that around the covenant bond, around the, uh, the relationship that you are committing uh, to, to uh, be more engaged in, to enter into, right? So I have married friends, right? Uh, and as soon as they got married, they like became basically like rare Pokemon, right? Like it's like super, super difficult to set anything up, super difficult to meet up with them, super difficult to you know, find time even to go like camping, outing, weekends. They're like, I have to check in with my wife to check in you know with my spouse it's like oh my gosh right very very difficult right again but why would they enter into this because marriage is worth it right they're pursuing a relationship of love and so they're voluntarily voluntarily giving up their freedoms so this is what jesus is saying right jesus is saying your concern with just being saved your concern with just a matter of salvation how many of us are going to go to heaven how many of us are going to get into the kingdom of god and how many of us are not going to go to hell right but there's something more that's important, right? But I tell you, this is what Jesus is saying. Those who are in an exclusive relationship with me are the ones who truly know me and are the ones who are going to heaven, right? And he says this, many will seek to enter and will not be able. Uh, many people want to go to heaven. This is what he's saying. Many people want to go to heaven, but few people want to be in an exclusive relationship with me. Think about that, right? A lot of people in today's day and age are choosing to not get married or get married later, right? A lot of people are actually, more and more people are actually against marriage, right? I read one, um, an article about a celebrity just saying, I don't ever plan to get married. They were like already in their 40s. They're like, why would I get married? You know, I, I love living the life I, I have. I love spending money however I want. I don't see why I would give this life up to enter into marriage. So they say, you know, I will never get married. That's, that's not just, that's just not for me, right? And, you know, I, I also saw a meme that said, why do I have to get married? I didn't do anything wrong, you know? Uh, it's like painting this, painting marriage to be this uh, restriction, right? Uh, you know, they put, they say the ring is actually like, it's like a chain, right? It's the shackles, right? <laughs> Bind you down once you're married. And, and so the more people see marriage as that, right? Exactly that. It's, it's the giving up their freedom. They're like, why would I do that? I don't want to do that. 
right? And that's what people are, that's what Jesus is saying here, right? They're, Jesus is saying a lot of people want to go to heaven. A lot, a lot of people want, you know, obviously not, not to be, not to go to hell, right? They want eternal life, but few people are actually willing to enter into a relationship that is exclusive with me. So as Christians, though, as Christians, though, we not only recognize that we are in this exclusive relationship with Jesus, but we actually cherish this relationship. We actually treasure this relationship. Why? Because just like, you know, my married friends are, right, we love Jesus. It's a relationship of love, of our greatest love. We know that outside of a love relationship with Jesus Christ, there is nothing that is of value to us. There is nothing that is of value in this life, right? That everything that has has value, everything that has any meaning in this life actually originates from the person of Christ, right? Anything that is good comes from, because it originates from God and his character and his goodness and who he is. And so we know that there is nothing that is of more importance to us, right? Than a, an exclusive relationship with Jesus Christ. And so we cherish it, you know, while, while other people say, why would I give up this freedom? I would never want to be in that kind of relationship. I want to do whatever I want. We actually want to give up, right? We are voluntarily giving up our freedoms because we cherish Jesus Christ. We cherish our relationship with him. Um, <clears throat> Uh, Charles Spurgeon once said this, nothing teaches us about the preciousness of the creator as much as when we learn the emptiness of everything else, right? We know this. We know that Jesus Christ is of the greatest worth. And so we, you know, when we hear this, we say, oh, yes, I want to pursue God. I want to pursue the exclusive relationship with you. I want to enter into the narrow door. I want to enter and I'm willing, not only willing, but I'm glad to do it, Jesus, because you mean everything to me. Right? And so that's the attitude that we are reminded to have as we listen to Jesus share this story. Okay, so if we are earnest about entering through the narrow door, if we are earnest about remaining in this exclusive relationship with Jesus, there, there are two things that we have to pay attention to. Okay? Two things that Jesus is going to mention to us today. And the first thing is this. He says, pursue Jesus today. Pursue Jesus today. If you're listening, you know, repeat after me, pursue Jesus today, all right? Jesus says in this passage, many will seek to enter and will not be able. When the master of the house is risen and shut the door, and you begin to stand outside and knock at the door, saying, Lord, open to us, then he will answer you, I do not know where you come from. So the people in this story knock on the door, but the problem is that it's too late. The problem is not that they never sought Jesus. It's not that they never desired this relationship with Jesus. It's not when they did desire it, when they did see the value in it, it was too late. The door has been shut and there is no more opportunity. The grace and the opportunity to pursue Jesus and the relationship with Jesus is for today. Why? Because there will be a time when it is too late. Every day, has its portion of grace. Every day has its portion of a relation, the relationship that you can grow in. And if you don't pursue that today, then that's just gone forever. You can always pursue it tomorrow, but the grace that was reserved for today is gone. And so we want to uh, invest into and, and, and grow our relationship with Jesus, not later, not when I have more time, not when I'm growing up, but we actually desire to pursue a relationship today. Okay. And it's also like saying this, uh, you know, there's that saying, if you can't accept me at my worst, then you don't deserve me at my best, right? I'm sure most of you guys have heard that, right? Um, if you don't accept me at my worst, you know, you don't deserve me at my very best. It's kind of like that, uh, except, you know, Jesus isn't this sassy person, but he's saying, if you don't pursue Jesus here and now, then you will not have Jesus in the there and then. If you do not pursue Jesus and the exclusive relationship with him today, here in this limited world, limited life that we have, then we will not have Jesus in the eternal life that is to come. It takes faith to pursue a relationship with Jesus. It takes faith because you don't see him, right? It, 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 it takes faith to believe that this relationship with Jesus is the most important thing. And it takes faith to pursue that, right, in the here and now. It's the worldly spirit, Guys, it's the worldly spirit that wants to live by sight. You pursue the worldly things 
and all of its pleasures, all of its glory, and the, all of its excesses today, because you get to see it, right? You see all the glamour, you see the glitz, you see the riches, you see the pleasures, you see all of those things, and you're like, yes, I want to have that now. But then when Jesus returns and all those things fade, when all those things disappear and they lose their value and you truly see that Christ is the only glorious being, he's the only beautiful thing, he's the only being of any worth, and then you're like, okay, now I see him, and you try to turn and pursue him, that's just a worldly spirit because none of that requires any faith. You're just moving by what you see with your physical eyes, right? You see what, you know, you're just living by what, by what you, uh, what enters into your vision, right? That's a very fleshly way of life, right? But the life that the Holy Spirit guides us is not to live by faith, uh, by sight alone, but to live by faith. He guides us to be able to see not the physical reality, but the spiritual realities of the glories of Jesus Christ and to know him and to grow in him and to desire him more and more intimately. So during this Lenten season, let me encourage you guys to pursue Jesus more closely and more intimately, but also more immediately right now. If you've been putting off spending time with Jesus, you know, um, to later, right? Always tomorrow, always next week, always, always, you know, sometime later, then let's do it today. Let's pursue Jesus today in the time that's been given to us right now. Let's seize the grace that has been apportioned for today. Let's not be those who live by sight, right? But let's be those um, who live by faith. Let's not be those who are knocking on the door when it's closed, when they're pursuing Jesus, when it's too late. Anyone can do that, but let's be people who are actively pursuing the exclusive relationship with Jesus here and now, All right? So let's make Jesus a priority as it should be for his disciples, okay? So that's the first thing. The second thing is that we have to pay, the second thing that we have to pay attention to is that there is a necessary evidence of change in our lives, okay? Please repeat after me. Evidence of change, evidence of change in our lives, in our lives right? Jesus also says in this passage, then you will begin to say, we ate and drank in your presence, and you taught in our streets. But he will say, I tell you, I do not know where you come from. Depart from me, all you workers of evil. You know, the people claim that they have known Jesus all along, right? They're like, Jesus, we know who you are, right? They're like, yeah, I mean, do you know, we've been in this relationship with you. We, we, we are try- we've been seeking the narrow door all along. Um, and and, and, you know, this is their way of thinking. Can you imagine if someone came to you and, and they said, hey, you know, you're my boyfriend, girlfriend, right? Like, you're my boyfriend or you're my girlfriend. And you're like, what? No, we're not, right? Like, I don't know you. Like, we're, we're, uh, <laughs> we're not, you know, that close. Um, and they're like, yeah, dude, like we've been dating for six months now. Um, and you have no idea who they are, right? I'd be like super, super odd, strange and like, kind of creepy, right? But that's exactly what's happening here, right? These people are like, Jesus, we know you. You know, we, we are actually married to you. You know, we're, we're intimate with you. And Jesus is like, no, you're not, right? I don't know who you are, you know, like, so depart from me, like, leave me, right? This is what he's saying. The reason that these people say and believe that they are close with Jesus is this. They say, Jesus, we ate and drank in your presence and you taught in our streets. This is what they're saying. We saw you. We were near to you. We even heard you teach. We went to church. We went to the worship services. We heard the messages. We grew up in a Christian home. You know, all of these things. We, we, we went through the routine. We were where you were at, you know, wherever, you know, service was, we were there. We were at church. But is that enough? And Jesus is saying it's not, Right. Because according to Jesus, there is another, there is a truer evidence that points to a genuine relationship with Jesus, and that is change. There's an evidence of change in the people who are in a genuine relationship with him. Jesus says to them, depart from me. And then what does he say? All you workers of evil, workers of evil. So I said previously that, you know, I was watching some video blogs about marriage. Another thing that these people were talking about was they, and again, they talked about the pros and cons. They talked about the con, but the pros, they said one of the benefits of marriage is that it forces you to mature, 
they force you to mature. I thought that was kind of interesting. Um, they said, because you have to live with another human being and coexist in the same space, it forces you to become mature. They forces you to become more patient, forces you to become more compassionate, forces you to become more understanding, right? More, more kind, right? If you don't mature, then what's going to happen is you're going to fight, fight, fight. You're going to get miserable. You're going to have like, you know, just, just a really, really terrible uh, living space and you're going to be super stressed, right? All the time. And so you are actually forced to mature, right? The same thing happens in our relationship with Jesus Christ, right? Those who are in a genuine, relation, genuine relationship with Jesus are forced to spiritually mature. Um, you cannot say that you are in a relationship with Jesus and never change. That, that's just not possible, right? It's like a married, married couple, right? Never, like, never changing. They have to because if they're in a relationship, again, like I said, they, they begin to put boundaries around their lives. You don't get to just live however you were, you know, when you were single. But they change. Their lifestyle changes. You know, their sleeping patterns change. The when, what they eat change. All of these things begin to change to meet, right? The spouse's styles, right? They fit each other, right? In the same way, we change if we're in a genuine relationship with Jesus. Charles Spurgeon also said this. The truth is that uh, the truth that is in Jesus was never palatable to the carnal man. He says, you know, Jesus is not palatable to carnal men. He says, Jesus in all of who he is, if you are worldly, if you are not a true, in a true relationship with him, is not palatable to you, right? It is not of any, any desire to you, right? It is like, ugh, to you, right? Because Jesus is too pure. He is too holy. He is too righteous. He is too just, right? And he exposes all of our sins, right? Wherever he goes, he brings conviction of the Holy Spirit, wherever he goes. Okay. And so if you are not, if you are not, right, in a relationship with Jesus, then you will, well, well, you will never change, right? But if you are, then you are forced to change, right? You're forced to leave your sinful habits behind. Why? Because you find Christ beautiful and the conviction of sin changes you, right? The real evidence of a relationship with Jesus is that you coexist with him and that in, in your, all right, you coexist with him in your heart and that you change, okay? That you change. If we are on the path to the narrow door, then we will be changing from one degree of glory to the next, uh, from one day to the next. Right? We will have less tolerance in our lives for sin because we treasure the holiness of God. We will have more love in our hearts because we adore the grace of the character of God. Right? We will fight less with our families. We will be more charitable to our neighbors. Right, And even in our walk with God, we will change our the things that we're concerned about will change. No longer will our prayers be only about ourselves. God, give me this, give me that. I want this, I want that. But our hearts will change and it will begin to pay more attention to the kingdom. It'll pay more attention to the nations. It'll pay more attention to the, to the lost, to the unsaved. And so we will slowly but surely change. Why? Because we're in a narrow, exclusive relationship with Jesus. And that's why God said, Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you, right? We change through the relationship with Christ. So I want to kind of conclude here. In this Lenten season, I hope that we can re-examine our hearts before God. You know, um, let's just examine our hearts and say, am I on the path to the narrow door? Am I in this exclusive relationship with Jesus, right? Have I just been religious? Have I just been kind of careless? Have I, you know, fooled myself into thinking that, yeah, I just, you know, I still go to church. I'm still listening to the word. You know, I'm still this, I'm just like at church and that should be enough. You know, as, as the people said, we ate with you. We sat at the table with you. We heard you teach in the streets and you're just saying, yeah, that's enough. But have we forgotten our first love? Have we forgotten that what it means to know Jesus is not just religiously, but it is relationally. And it is to remember that we are in an exclusive relationship with him. So if you've been neglecting that during this time, during the, due to the pandemic, due to the chaos, right? Due to time at home, due to disorder, due to time spent consuming media and games and all other things, let's take this time to turn back to God. Let's pursue Jesus more. The exclusive relationship, right? Let's pursue that together. 
today, okay? And the second thing is, if you've been thinking, again, if you've been thinking you're doing okay because you're just in church, you know, but there's little change in your life, little evidence that you are in this relationship, right? You're still the bachelor. You're still living however you want. You're still sleeping out, you know, at your friends whenever you want. You have no regard for the Holy Spirit and the Spirit of Christ that is in you, right? Who coexists with you, who is in this exclusive relationship with you. You don't care to let them know, you know, when you're going to be, you know, spending the night out with your friends. You just do whatever you want. If you've been living life that way, let's turn back to him. Let's make, let's just, let's, let's turn and, and say, God, I want my life to continually be bound by the restrictions because I want to enter into the, to a deeper intimacy. I want to enter into the depths of the relationship. If you are in, you know, um, uh, habits of life that is displeasing to God, right? Let's make the confession today and say, God, I want to walk away from these things and pursue you more holy, pursue you more holy, right? Um, and, you know, we don't have to, we don't want to ignore areas of our lives. We don't want to hide it. But we actually want to bring those things out before God to bring, you know, any, any area of our lives that we are ashamed of or you know, feel guilty about. We don't have to actually be afraid, but we bring them before God and we're strengthened by the grace that he offers so that, right, we can be restored and we can pursue the relationship with him once again. And so, um, you know, as we close, if, you know, these things speak to your heart, I pray that, you know, you would respond. You respond at this time. And so let me close this in a word of prayer. And, um, you know, while we pray also that you would use this time to pray individually to the Lord and take this time to um, have your relationship just be restored once again. And so let me pray in closing for us. Father, we thank you so much for this time that we can go through your word and that we hear when we see, uh, when we see Jesus speaking, we don't just hear, you know, a bystander or a stranger talking, but we, we hear our, our, our groom. We hear our lover. We hear our father speaking to us. And God, you speak such words of truth, saying uh, it's not just about salvation. It's not just about, you know, getting into heaven. It's not just about saying, I'm, I, I said the sinner's prayer, and now I'm just going to heaven. That's just the beginning of the relationship that you desire for us. At this time, especially in this Lenten season, we confess that, God, we have neglected the relationship with you for far too long. But, God, we also want to turn to you more. We want to, God, be changed in our relationship into your character, into your holiness, into your purity, into your love. Father, I pray that you would take our hearts again, make it yours, and God, that we would help, you would help us, strengthen us to be able to live our lives more and more for you. God, you are our greatest treasure. You are our greatest love. So God, we treasure this relationship with you above more than anything else that we have in this life. We thank you once again for this truth and for your love and for your grace. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Thanks so much. Um, again, look forward to seeing you guys in person soon. Um, we hope you guys have a rest, great rest of the Sunday. All right. Bye.